Hi, everyone. Welcome to our event, Lessons Learned in the Major Professor-Graduate-Student Relationship, a Conversation. My name is Kate Diamond, and I work with the CERTL Network, and I am so happy to see so many people here at the end of the week, right after the holidays, as we're all still adjusting back to being at work. I have to apologize. I have a sick baby that I'm looking after, so you might hear some odd noises and shirts in the background as I speak. Um, just a couple um, um, tips for the online environment before we get started. If you have not attended programming with CERTL before, welcome. Um, you can chime in at any time with comments or questions. The chat window is an excellent tool for that. Um, if you don't already have the chat window visible, you should see a purple tab in the lower right corner of your screen. Click that to expand the menu where you can access the chat window. Um, you can also use your microphone to ask questions or share comments, and there will, of course, be a designated Q&A um, period at the end of our event today uh, where you can chime in with questions that um, we don't have time for during the discussion. A lot of today is going to be a very thought-out discussion amongst our panelists. Um, and I just want to contextualize that a little bit before we get started by talking a bit more about what CERTL is. We often find that people who come to our online events um, are new to CERTL, so I want to say welcome to all of you and thanks for finding us. We are the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning. We're a network of 37 universities in the U.S. and Canada working to make the sciences more diverse by changing how they're taught. Of course, that's the simple elevator pitch of what we do. What we do day to day can be quite complicated. Um, we teach some grad students and postdocs about inclusive, evidence-based teaching and learning so that they can become excellent researchers and teachers. And you can learn more about what we do, who we are, are and our approach to STEM education at our website, www.sertle.net. And I have a crying toddler, so rather than say more, I will turn things over to our speakers so that they can kick off the event. Thank you so very much, Kate. Our objective today is to talk about the major professor graduate student relationship and the fact that it's very significant. The quality of this professional bond is one of the strongest predictors of student success. We look forward to discussing some key lessons that we've learned over the course of our uh, relationship today as mentor and mentees. So I'll pause now to begin with some introductions and I'll turn it over to the students. Uh, my name is Maria Sivad. I am on my fifth year of my PhD program in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at Iowa State University, and my research is on immigration policy and the health and well-being of Latinx families. And my name is Leslie Winters. I am also in Human Development and Family Studies, and I am in my second year of the doctoral program, and my research interests are colorism and um, parents' use of artifacts in developing self-efficacy in their children. Ebony? We can't hear you. Ebony, uh, you might want to make sure that your microphone is on. It looks like it's off right now. Hello? Yes. Great. Hello, my name is Ebony Williams. I am a fifth year PhD student at Iowa State University. My research interests include um, faculty relationships and social support. Thank you all, and my name is Tara Jordan. I have the pleasure of serving as an associate professor of human development and family studies in the College of Human Sciences, and I'm also the assistant provost for faculty development at Iowa State University. And perhaps more importantly, pertinent to our conversation today, I have the distinct honor of serving as these women's uh, major professor and co-major professor in Leslie's case. So let's begin with the overview. And so today, uh, the items that we're going to cover is we're going to define what mentoring is. We're going to describe how the mentor relationships began. And then we're going to assess the alignment in student learning needs and Dr. Jordan's mentoring philosophy and expectations and discuss diversity in student learning. In terms of how we define mentoring, we propose that 
mentoring exists when a professional person serves as a resource, sponsor, and transitional figure for another person, usually but not necessarily younger, who is entering the same profession. Effects, effective mentors provide mentees with knowledge, advice, talent, and support as mentees pursue the acquisition of professional competence and identity. The mentor welcomes the less experienced person into the profession and represents the values, skills, and success that the neophyte professional person intends to acquire someday. So to set the stage for our discussion, uh, this first part about starting points, I'd like to begin with a quote from one of my colleagues here at Iowa State University, Dan Nettleton. He said, quote, help students follow their dreams even if their dreams are not your dreams. Ask not what your student can do for you. Ask what you can do for your student. Focus on helping students achieve their goals. The benefits to you will inevitably accrue. And so it's with that that we'd like to begin with a discussion about starting points, and that is how each of these women came to uh, be under my mentorship or establish a mentoring relationship with me. We know from the literature that a key factor in the retention of diverse students is effective mentorship. The impact of inequality and social isolation is well established in the literature as related to outcomes concerning academic achievement, mental health, and a desire to quit graduate study. So to all the students, I propose this question to you. How did our mentoring relationship begin? So I'll start because uh, the way that I uh, met Dr. Jordan or started this mentorship relationship was non-traditional. Um, it was actually a time that it was very difficult for me uh, during my master's program. I was uh, about to finish writing or in an attempt to finish writing my thesis um, for my master's degree. And I was having some trouble with um, getting a, a mentorship on the methods section that I was um, that I was conducting for that for that for that study, and it was at a conference uh, where uh, I basically had a breakdown, um, and I'm sure graduate students who are listening know about that. Um, they uh, it it was a time that I just needed some support from someone that already had the experience. And it was my colleague, student, graduate student friends who actually connected me with Dr. Jordan during the conference. Um, and I was actually crying. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Jordan um, talked to me. She said, um, we, we have time to work through this. Um, you need to you know, take some time to read some literature that I can send to you, et cetera, et cetera. And um, she said, because you're going to continue on to your PhD, right? And I was like, no, I, this is it for me. Like I'm, I'm finished. Like I'm doing this uh, thesis and I'm done. Like I need to leave the school. I'm tired. I can't do this. And she looked at me and she said, "You're going back to your hotel room and you're going to look at the courses that you need for the PhD and then we're gonna have a conversation. And meanwhile, you're going to try to add me to your committee so that I can advise you more thoroughly with the methods section." Because at the time I was doing a qualitative analysis, and Dr. Jordan is an expert on that. So that's how our mentorship began. But before that, I, I would like to mention that um, there was a lot of um, uh, situations happening at Iowa State University where I was involved in student activism and um, a lot of things that were happening in 2016. So I received an email from Dr. Jordan, uh, basically showing her support and letting me know that her door was open if I needed it to talk about the racism, discrimination, and everything that was going on around campus. And to me, that meant a lot because I didn't know her, but she still reached out to me. Um, and I never actually responded. I never responded to her because obviously I was involved and I was like, I don't know who this person is, but I had heard of her good reputation. Now, moving forward, maybe like a year later, that's when I actually met her in person and she immediately offered her assistance even by just giving me some references to look over for my uh, for my thesis at the time. So that's how our mentor relationship began. 
And now I'm lucky to have her as my major professor for my PhD, and it's been a blessing, really, to have you. Um, and I'm not just saying that because she's here. It's really, ha it really has been transformative to, uh, you know, make that change uh, and find a good fit for me and my my research. Um, well, I met Dr. Jordan through a course, and so and it was in my second semester, my first year. And at the end of that course, um, I decided to go and have a conversation in her office and talked about, you know, how my first full year had gone. And it, it was my intention at that time to leave um, the program and the institution um, because of the people that were put in place to support me. I felt like um, I was receiving messages that I would be unsuccessful in the program. And I didn't understand this because I felt like I was doing well um, in my courses. And so I didn't really understand. I thought maybe there was something that I was missing throughout this process. Um, and so at that time, we decided, or Dr. Jordan decided she was going to add herself <laughs> as a co advisor to my um, advising team. And so that was wonderful. And, you know, to have someone who was listening and validating the experience that I was having um, and not just saying, well, I don't know that this to be an accurate account of what's going on. And so I feel like in trying to get assistance in other places and asking folks and telling my story, I was met with, well, I don't know this to be, you know, a, a normal occurrence here. And so that to me felt like you weren't listening or validating um, the experiences that I was having. And so I, I kind of isolated myself in that first year. And if I wasn't in class or performing any kind of assistantship duties, my time was spent at home or in the library. And so I really did not get to engage as much with peers and things of that nature. Um, and so I, I didn't really feel a great sense of belonging to the program until being introduced to all of the students that Dr. Jordan um, advises. And then from there, I was able to build relationships and form a study group um, with a member from the team. And so that has really changed how this second year has gone because I've had continual support. Um, and I think that being co-advised by the advisors that I do have has been a really great experience for me um, because it's given me two folks who are invested and want to see me succeed. But then also I get a variety of um, opinion on how things should be done um, and influence and resources and advice simply on you know, how to make this work. So um, my experience is a bit different. Um, I came into the program with Dr. Jordan as my major professor. Um, one of the things that stands out in my mind, though, in terms of mentoring is um, during that second semester of my first year, my mom was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And um, she was living with me in Iowa at the time. And, you know, as a first year PhD student trying to navigate being in the program and then caring for a sick parent, never lot. And just in terms of mentoring, um, Dr. Jordan was there and kind of helped me think outside of the box. Like she was thinking of things that I wasn't thinking about in terms of how can I get my lesson and still be there for my mom? How can I get things done and still, you know, be traveling back and forth to Des Moines? So, um, you know, that was a very hard time for me. But, um, you know, the sense I got from Dr. Jordan was, you're not going to quit. Like, you can make it through this. You know, we're in a day and age where you can be, you can get into class remotely. You have all these different options. So not completing this isn't an option. So just in terms of um, that, in terms of our um, mentoring relationship, that was one of the first experiences um, that let me know not only could I trust Dr. Jordan, but she was looking out for my academic well-being. Well, thank you all. I appreciate that. And um, I'd like to now move on to talk a little bit about um, my philosophy to mentorship. 
Um, this quote from Bruce Shore's book, um, which was published in 2014 on graduate mentoring, I think is very uh, pertinent to the conversation at this point. Everyone is happier when mutual roles are clear and understood from the beginning. The purpose here is to establish a clear mutual advisee, um, um, uh, advising relationship, a foundation of mutual respect between the advisor and advisee regarding what will and will not be included in the advisory connection. So in terms of alignment, um, Ebony and Maria and Leslie are three of the now seven women that I have assumed responsibility for mentoring. And I begin with um, a discussion about what my mentoring philosophy and expectations are. And so despite having a passion for them as emerging scholars in the field, ultimately my question is about fit. There are some things about how I mentor and the way in which I mentor that may not work for them. And so we have a discussion at that first early meeting to establish expectations to help promote transparency and trust and openness. And essentially not to go down a road where my needs are not being met from them and vice versa, that their needs are not being met by me. So the first thing I establish with them is that when they schedule meetings with me or we have regular meetings, it is their responsibility to set goals. Those might be short-term goals and long-term goals, but I expect them to take responsibility of their programs of study and they want to be three, five years after they complete their programs here at Iowa State. We focus on goal setting, we focus on their motivations, their values, their learning needs, and um, then I'm there to help guide or to advise uh, things that maybe I, they're not thinking about or to slow the timeline down with dissertation writing or any number of things, uh, but they kind of come to the table with, here's where my thoughts are, here's, here's where I'd like to go. Um, it, I'm a major professor where I prefer to meet every two weeks as needed or as needed, um, meeting weekly as for me as a faculty member does not work well. Um, I just find that it's a little bit too, um, too much for me in terms of time. It's a little bit too much for me in terms of engagement. Um, and so there are some students that need that weekly contact and most respectfully, I'm not the right major professor for them. Um, unless there's a critical deadline or a critical concern that we need to address, they can count on seeing me every two weeks or once a month as some of the students are doing their deep in their dissertation work. So once a month kind of works well for them. I also expect them to participate in monthly group meetings. And this is where we have special topics where I get involved in or engaged in some reflection about um, academic life or um, different aspects of the academy. Um, we've had topics focused on navigating historically white institutions, writing um, each one of the dissertation chapters. We had a meeting focused on each one of those chapters. Um, right now I'm fresh out of ideas and so the students are taking the lead on a topic area in 2020. In the month of February, we're going to talk about negotiating salary and benefits that will be led by one of the students that will re recommend a reading or a video, and then we'll engage in discussion about that in the group meeting time. Group meeting time is about an hour, hour and a half. Um, and then the March topic, as an example, will be using social media for research. Half of my students are in residence and the other half are not. And so we do typically have group meetings in the online environment in a Zoom, using Zoom video conferencing, which we have found very effective and helpful um, for even the students that are in residence. It just allows them some flexibility with not necessarily getting to campus or doing something else for that one hour, or one and a half hour time period. But also the advantage of Zoom is that I can record the conversations for the students and then post it in our shared uh, cloud-based um, folder and they can refer to it at a later date once those topics become much more pertinent to their 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 uh, journey. I'm very intentional about sharing information at the group level unless it con concerns their specific professional or research interest. Um, it helps to level the playing field, it helps promote trans transparency, and it sends a message that I am not playing favorites. So essentially, if I cannot use the group list to send out information, 
uh, to everybody, I almost never share that information unless I can identify that this is very pertinent to Leslie's program of study or pertinent to Maria's research interest or pertinent to Ebony's uh, job search, okay? Another thing my students know is I do not ask their personal lives. I allow them to raise key points with me as they feel comfortable. I only ever ask them very consistently in group meetings and individual meetings, how are you today? They know that this is a really important boundary for me to set. Um, as their major professor, we are all women of color. Um, there will be plenty of time to have a personal relationship after they are all graduated and doctors, and yes, I'm claiming it, that will happen. Mm -hmm. But as for now, it is important for me to be able to have those difficult conversations with them to help them grow, to help challenge them accordingly, and sometimes that can get confounded once you have personal ties um, with students. This relates to a framework um, that was outlined in the literature and that will be in the re references document that is shared uh, with the participants in today's conversation called the Holistic and Intersectional Ecological Framework. It is not that any of the students, um, all of them have shared personal things with me as it became pertinent and relevant, but once you get entrusted with that ability to support and to guide and sometimes to say, you, you know better, this is not going to work, let's think about this a little bit differently, that attention, that, that privilege of having a voice, emotional, their psychological, their academic, their relational and professional well-being, in my opinion, should be used with great care. And so um, while they may have very sensitive and deeply personal, rather traumatic and difficult concerns that come up in the time of their journey to the PhD, I make myself available as they need me. We get through that season, and then I almost never come back and say, how was that matter resolved or, or what have you. I just leave it up to them to decide how much more they want to talk about it and how much more they want to disclose. Um, they know that it's not that I don't care about them personally, it's that my priority in our relationship is to get them through the door, to get them across that stage, to get graduated, and I really choose not to mix business and pleasure until I get them all hooded and out the door. And so I'm focused on their scholarly productivity and their academic engagement. If I do notice that some things are not going as well, you get to know them and their styles rather individually, that is the frame and the lens by which I may bring up is everything going okay? I've noticed a lag in your academic engagement. I've noticed that you have not been producing as much. Is there anything you'd like to share? Is there anything that we need to, I need to be aware of? Essentially, I try and monitor my mentoring and, and ask myself, would I be pleased if we exchange roles? That means that sometimes I have to be uh, very direct and honest with them about the quality of their work, how I think it'll be received in scholarship, things that they need to work on. But they also know when things are going great, I'm their greatest cheerleader, and a lot of times I'm the first person to hear, uh, hear about news, fellowships, and national awards, like in Maria's case, or, wow, I really finally got the connection that you made with me about theory and, and methods. I was sitting in the class, and the light bulb um, went off. So really kind of keeping that in mind, and um, sometimes, you know, when I don't know what to do, I, I lean with my heart and just trust that the rest kind of will work out. So I'd like to ask the students if they have anything else they'd like to contribute in this section on alignment. We've got just uh, a few minutes you guys can talk about. Um, I think a major point for me here is um, who we are and who we are perceived to be are important in the mentor relationship. Um, it's, that's why it's very important for my style. I'm very transparent with people about who I am and what I need um, and then allow the conversation to happen. And then from there, I can see what it is um, that I can receive from this mentor relationship, um, but then also that allows us to talk about what that person is able to give me 
in that relationship. And so that to me is an important piece here. I will add um, the dynamic that Dr. Jordan has created within our research group, I think has been very beneficial. Um, just in terms of, like she said, um, having those boundaries in our relationships. So when you have those difficult conversations, we're able to receive it and and um, recognize that it, this is coming from her as a mentor. And um, an example that I have of that is I turned in a, um, a draft of my lit review back in October and I got an email back from Dr. Jordan and, and I looked at it and I said, oh, oh this is not going to be good. <laughs> like it, it just it just read to me like she was not pleased with my late review. So I texted Maria and I said, Maria, I got this email from Dr. Jordan. I am not sure what's going to happen during this conversation. And Maria texted back and said, whatever happens is going to make it better. So she's going to tell you what you need to know. You're going to make those changes and you're going to move on. And I really appreciated having Maria, somebody who was in the group, to bounce that back off of you know she also knows dr jordan knows her style knows that okay but then also knows the other part of this like waiting to get that feedback back is not the feedback that i wanted okay so now i gotta pick up take the feedback and and move on from there so i really appreciated having um the group of women around the table to just um bounce ideas up but also i think the way our group is structured has also contributed to the strength of our relationship as a research group. I would say that um, going off of what Ebony said, it just it just shows that we, all of us, and I would just say we, because <laughs> I feel like strong about this comment, is we all feel that Dr. Jordan has the best interest for us. Um, so, there's no questioning, there's no, um, you know, what if she doesn't like me, what if this, what if that, there's no questioning. We know that Dr. Jordan is looking out for, for us, for our research, for academic success, for us as professionals. So to me, that was a simple, you know, text back to Ebony and say, it's going to make it better, whatever it is that she will say. Whatever it is that she said to you, it will make it better, and so we got to take it. And it's going to her, and it's going to be painful, and we're going to put in a lot more work, but that's what we have to do and in order to graduate. So I appreciate that, for sure. I can appreciate that those comments. Thank you. One of the things that we talk about is being women of color, the opportunity to shine, the requirements to be on point, to be excellent in all that we do, um, an acknowledgement that there are still things that we're working through in higher education where the field is not yet level for us as women, let alone us as women of color. And so let's just use that as an opportunity to grow, to support one another. There's no sense in lamenting. We live in an unequal world. Let's just capitalize on it and let's be sure that we support one another. Um, another thing that comes to mind is something we talked about in group meeting more, more recently, and one of the students conceded, I'm ready to quit this week, and we were all like, yeah, been there before, <laughs> but I think it helps to, uh, for me to be transparent about my own journey. Of course, there were many times I wanted to quit in uh, graduate study when I was at Penn State. There were many times that I had questions about feedback I was, give, I was given. There were times that I did not feel well, did not, you know, feel engaged in the department. And so all of these conversations help to normalize um, the process and that you're not the only one, which ultimately I think helps to promote community and build community. Um, I don't know anyone who's received a PhD that didn't think about quitting at some point. But it can kind of feel that way if you are not well connected to other folks that are on the other side. And so we talk about that quite a bit. Um, Ebony, if I could use your statement that you shared before in a previous meeting is that when you name something, um, when you speak to it, then they don't have power over you anymore. And I want to thank you for sharing that in a previous group meeting. And I think that's very true about a number of issues um, that come up in group meetings. Um, about how people are feeling, how they're engaged, 
um, and more importantly, how they're pursuing um, in their program of study. Anything else before we move on to the next area? So now we'd like to spend some time talking about diversity in student learning and diversity and student learning. And one of the great joys in preparing for this CERTLCAST today was having a conversation with my students about psychological safety and mentoring relationships and the role that it plays in promoting inclusive settings. So Khan and Clark have described psychological safety as an ability to be oneself without fear of negative consequences of your self-image of or professional pursuit, pursuits, being valued and included and feeling safe to learn, contribute, and challenge the status quo without, being, without fear of being marginalized. And so these particular considerations, I think, contribute to um, the type of relationship, mentoring relationship that I share with the students, but also help them know that um, there is safety amongst themselves, but also safety with me, as they may need to um, work through or disclose um, seemingly otherwise sensitive things. So I'll turn it over to them now to get into a discussion about some of the key considerations that may arise and the ways in which psychological safety uh, may be challenged in mentoring relationships. So I would start by saying that everybody has biases and different beliefs and nobody is free from biases, right? So in previous experiences, um, it just, just happened to come up a lot more um, and in a way that was kind of detrimental to my uh, mental health and um, also my performance as a student. So I would say that um, in, in, in those situations, um, it is hard to, try to think of yourself as a leader or to try to say, I need to end this relationship because we ha there's a hierarchy, right? So as graduate students, we're always kind of um, trying to navigate these spaces, especially as graduate students of color or with a marginalized identity, you want to be careful of how you navigate some difficult situations. Uh, it may be uh, microaggressions or racism, discrimination, or simply comments that are based on biases, right? So um, for me, it's kind of um, refreshing to be able to not necessarily uh, even address the issue, but move away from that, those relationships um, and, and learn from those relationships. And it took, um, it took a, a friend of mine who's a white woman uh, student to actually point it out to me and say, um, this is going on during a meeting, during a working meeting that we had. She was the person that actually made me realize that it was true, the way that I was feeling, it was true that the things that were said in previous meetings and the way that I was feeling about them were real and valid because this white student friend of mine literally said, after meeting uh, with this professional, um, she literally said, I am sorry that you had to go through that. And I'm, I'm sorry that, that I had to, that we went through this or, and that I didn't speak up. And to me, it felt like I should have spoken up and, and, but then again, why, right? Uh, well, I'm going to burn bridges. I'm going to, I don't know what, what could happen in that situation. So for me, it was best to step away from that project and out to Dr. Jordan at the time and say, this is what's going on and this is what happened and this is how I feel about it. And I was never even considering stepping away from this relationship, but I know that for my well-being, that's the best thing I could do. And it, it was never something confrontational. It was never something that, you know, I burned a bridge or anything of that sort. Simply my, my research, where it's going, and uh, what I need as a mentor is going a different way. And so, you know, we'll have to part ways. And so, and then again, uh, to me, it wasn't something that was aggressive. You know, the comments that were said or the, the things that were said during many meetings, it wasn't anything aggressive, but it was still something that 
bother me enough uh, to say this is not healthy for me and this relationship is not any beneficial for me. And so that was a lesson that I had to learn the hard way. Um, I think for me, it was, um, in my experience, I think that I learned that there's a difference between um, the items that you're going to get from someone who is a lecturer versus a full-time faculty member. Uh, and so I think some of those things, um, the, how they do the work as far as teaching you how to be a faculty member, if that's what you're choosing to do after you graduate, is different from, I think, I would say on the other side, more tasks that are given to you. And so the, the learning and what you gain from that difference is um, very crucial. If, if tenure track faculty is what you want to be, I think there's more um, enhanced things that you're going to get in your training from a, a faculty member. And so, like, in my experience, I think that's what I've been navigating and trying to figure out, okay, what are the differences here? But then for me, also, too, a part of it is there's difference in personality as well. And so that diversity there is important to understand um, and try to sit with. And so for me, I do a lot of internal reflection about all of the, the encounters and relationships that I have in the department and trying to figure out, okay, what can I take from this? How can I learn? How can I be better? Um, and where should I speak up uh, in the moment to a variety of people about, okay, maybe this should have been handled in this way versus how we did it. And so um, that has been really, my experience has been one of reflection on all of the um, encounters that I've had with the people in the department. Um, but then also, too, I think these things are important to know um, because that psycho psychological safety piece is huge. And so if someone can feel comfortable and know that this is a space that they aren't going to feel harmed, then they'll be more willing to engage with you about this as opposed to retreating and isolating. Okay, thank you, Ebony. In terms of psychological safety, you know, I think about my time during um, at Iowa State in the PhD program and, um, you know, during that time, like I said earlier, my mom was diagnosed with cancer, but then also she ended up passing a couple of years later. And um, for me, that psychological safety with Dr. Jordan as my mentor was really important because I'm here, you know, going through this very traumatic, life-changing experience and then also going through another life-changing experience, getting my PhD. So, like, how do I balance all of that? And, you know, Dr. Jordan in her leadership was always not only just the way she mentors, but I also think she leads by example. So, like, the ability to say no to things, um, making sure that we stay on top of our email, all of the lessons that I feel like I've learned the hard way about being a better professional. I feel like um, a lot of that was taught by example through um, my mentoring relationship with Dr. Jordan. But um, also another thing that stands out to me was, you know, after my mom passed, I walked into my apartment one day and I just felt like there was nothing left in Ames for me. And I made a decision that I wanted to move back to New Orleans. And I said to myself, I'm going to tell two people. And if these two people are on board, then I know I'm doing it. And the two people were my aunt, who was like one of my dearest friends, and Dr. Jordan. And I said, Dr. Jordan knows me academically, and my aunt knows me personally. If they think that I can make this move and still be successful, I'm going to do it. So both of them, gave. they were like, Ebony, that's a great idea. And I was like, well, I can do it. And you know, I, I had some some opinions and people would be like, well, are you sure you wanna do that? But I was like, if my aunt says I can do it, if Dorian says I can do it, I'm good. <laughs> like this, it will work out, I will be successful. You know, I, I know that this is the right decision for me. So I think that that support also showed in, you know, supporting the decision to um, make a, a decision for my mental health that meant 
leaving the institution, but still through the relationship with Dr. Jordan and the research group, I'm still able to be connected. Hey, thank you, Ebony. So part of my support for half of my students who at one point were in residence but are now out of residence is a recognition that life changes. And um, they all got to a point with their coursework where they felt, and honestly, they had needs depending on their partners or spouses to be in another place than Ames, Iowa. I am very aware that not all of my colleagues um, would be supportive of that, but ultimately it's a focus on what's best for them, what's best for them finishing their programs, and what's really the cost here. And um, Ebony, in a lot of respects, is um, working um, clear in mind. She's balancing the demands of being in a place that never sleeps, like the Big Easy, which is honestly good preparation for her as a faculty member. Um, the demands never end. You have to make decisions about work-life balance. Um, have we had conversations about um, deadlines and you know her time in the chair writing? Of course we have. Um, but at the same time, I do see her now um, having found herself recentered herself, really blossoming as a scholar after we've had some tough conversations, and I'm not really sure she would have gotten there having stayed in residence, to be perfectly honest. I do see a different Ebony than I saw a year, year and a half ago. Um, also, it's informed by the fact that I also um, spent the last part of my year in graduate school not in residence in State College, Pennsylvania. I also got to a point where mental health-wise, time-wise, just really needed to shift gears, and that ended up becoming really key in my ability to recenter myself and focus and, um, and finish out uh, the PhD program. So I think we have to think about um, one, sometimes checking um, what our first choice would be for them and recognizing, okay, if you're going to do this, here's some things I'm concerned about, but ultimately these women are all adults and um, they need to make decisions in not only their best interest, but also the best interest of their families and their committed relationships. I think another thing that's also important to highlight in this section is that sometimes in the academy we can be a little bit harsh when, in my opinion, when students need to change uh, major professors or mentors. Um, it'd be wonderful if every major professor student relationship lasted a lifetime. But the reality is sometimes they only last for a reason and a season. And that doesn't necessarily reflect poorly on the student nor the faculty member. It just, it wasn't a fit. We got a master thesis done and then needed to pivot and do something else. Or sometimes it's a recognition that how they work doesn't meld with what I need. And this includes being responsive to email, um, keeping appointment times, um, giving really thorough feedback on drafts and dissertations and theses and other writing matters that you have. And I mean, ultimately, I feel like when you sign the paperwork, you know what the deal is as a faculty member. And if you can't kind of fulfill that, then maybe you need to make a different choice. And a lot of times I hear from students that I think basic things and work relationships are not being met. And so I think it's a recognition from students that I can only control what I can. Let me focus on what I can control. Um, and if necessary, that may mean need to pivot. Um, a conversation that I just had with a student, I've taken her on now for six months in order to get her out of the door. But I said, we need to have a conversation about my mentoring style and relationship that may not work for you, even though I know that you are hoping to graduate in May, you're in a tight bind, I understand how I could help you here, but at the same time, there may be some ways in which I conduct business respectfully that may not work for you. And then I do try and always acknowledge and honor the students and their commitment um, around the holidays. And so it's tough to buy for six women, uh, but what we found is that we've gone to cups, and cups with a special saying on it. So last year's cup um, had the saying on it from Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible, 
until it, all of them were feeling like it's impossible that I'm ever going to be done with this program of study, this doctoral program. And so that was a nice way to kind of inspire a little bit of inspiration. But this year's cup was you're closer than you've ever been. And that was inspired by a quote from um, one of my mentors in graduate school, Dr. Katherine Lyons, who used to say that to us all the time when our head was hanging low, when our spirits were low. You know, everything is, you know, the glass is um, half empty type of mentality. And she would always find a way to spin whatever we were working on, whatever we were doing. But isn't that great? Because now you're closer than you've ever been. And so that was the saying for this year's cup. Um, and it's great to see in the video conference, the students are drinking out of their cups. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what's in those cups. That's maybe a different, <laughs> that's a different sort of cast. Uh, but, you know, the fact that they're using them and they're using it for inspiration is another way in we try and promote um, a group unity or group identity um, and cohesiveness. I actually have my cup with me. <laughs> I don't, so I, I, I definitely use this as inspiration. So sometimes when I'm like, oh, it's been a long day, I want to come in and watch some Netflix. I look at my cup and it's like, I got to get to work. <laughs> okay. So it's definitely been an inspiration and motivation just to, to see the cup as, as a reminder of, you know, if nothing else, I got a group of women who believe that I can do this. So I'm going to do it. Thank you, Ebony. So as we close, I want to draw attention to some posted resources um, that we've prepared for you and um, some national resources on graduate mentoring, lots of links around the country that can help um, not only you develop a mentoring philosophy or if you're a faculty member on the call or as students as you're thinking about mentoring students of your own or what that relationship should look like. What are some opportunities and some challenges in the current relationships you're in? They're all really great resources. Um, as we close today, I just really want to thank Maria and Ebony and Leslie for what for me was an opportunity to give out to the 37 institutions that are part of the CERL network, but I really gained much more by learning so much more about you three women. Um, I'm your major professor. I thought I knew you very well, but through the conversations that we had in preparation for today, the three or four meetings that we had, I really have had um, such a, uh, a rich and enhanced opportunity to learn more about your individual journeys and your perceptions and how you're feeling about the progress that you've made. And so I just really want to say thank you. It's been such a rich opportunity for me, I think, to really allow me to mentor you in a much more effective manner. Not to say it wasn't effective before, but I think there are certain niches and unique experiences that we've shared in the meetings leading up to today's event um, that really gave me a really uh, a great opportunity to learn more about you and your journey. So I really want to thank you all for that. Um, it was just a really fine opportunity for me to grow and learn as um, a, now a senior faculty member and an advanced um, you know, faculty member having trained graduate students now for the um, seven or eight years that I've been here at Iowa State. And um, I hope our conversation today has been enriching uh, for you all. Um, I would just like to send out a message to the graduate students that are um, online right now and simply say you're not always, obviously, you're not always going to have perfect professional relationships. And so graduate school is the same thing. And um, there are always lessons to be learned from these difficult situations and relationships. And so try to find the sil silver lining in these situations and always uh, reach out to those that you trust uh, to vent, uh, to discuss, and then to strategize on, on what to do next. And then for the faculty and staff that are on, I would like to say that um, you're not always going to know exactly what to do or what to say, especially when you're working with um, students of color or students with marginalized identities. Uh, but being genuine and um, being empathetic is it makes a big difference. And so that's the main two messages that I had. And I would say for everyone, I think, I know we've talked a lot about it today, um, but transparency and honesty speaks volumes in the mentor-mentee relationship, um, especially when you're mentoring students of color. 
the one thing I think of um, is that trust trust your mentee. Um, so if your mentee is saying, you know, I feel a particular way about this or um, this has come up for me, it's really important that that person feels heard. Um, you know, I can say that there have been a number of times, especially in my relationship with Dr. Jordan, where I've said, you know, I, I need this to be successful. And I felt like she heard me out. There have been other times where I said the same thing and was not really received well. So, and then sometimes it kind of made me feel like, well, am I not being trusted because I'm a woman of color? Like, what is the reason why I'm not being trusted to make this decision? So I think it's really important, you know, and I also understand that there are other conversations um, that come along when people make whatever decision they need to make about their program. But also, I think it's important, what was most important to me was that I felt heard. Um, more than anything. So I needed to change that decision or reconsider the fact that Dr. Jordan and other people in my air, in my um, network heard me out and actually heard what I was feeling. I think that that made it better to kind of figure out what my next steps would be. Okay, thank you all. Um, we've got one question on the floor. And so um, as a new professor, um, I lost the question. That, okay, there. Is there any recommendation about the number of graduate students that should be mentored? Thanks for the great information and the resources you provided. Thank you so very much. Um, I think it depends on the department that you're in, the institution that you're at, and so I would encourage you to have a conversation with your department chair about expectations related to promotion and tenure. Um, for example, when I started at Iowa State University, I was strongly advised not to mentor any graduate students in a major professor role for the first year. And I think that that um, advice served me well to be sure that I got to Iowa State, got my research agenda up and going, was doing well in the classroom, and had an opportunity to make an impact in service. Now came the second year. Um, I think I maybe took on one or two, but by the time I went up for tenure, um, I needed to have graduated students uh, with PhDs. I did that. I needed to have graduated students with masters. I did that. I was serving on a number of um, um, dissertation and thesis committees. I was chairing those committees. And so it really depends on the norms that you're at. So I'm at a research intensive university. Training the next generation of research scholars is critically important. And even more so as I go up now for full professor here in the next you know, five to six years. So that conversation with your department chair about expectations, about where you need to be at the five, six year mark when your packet goes in will then help guide not only when you should be telling students, um, but also how many students you should be mentoring. So in our department, a, a number of five is a good number. Right now, I'm a little above the grain at seven, but one is definitely graduating um, in, in the summer, and the other three are coming out real soon. So I've taken on one or two more because I don't need to do as much mentoring in the first couple of years. It's really once they get to the thesis work and into the dissertation work that more of those meetings and more of those conversations become um, much more regular and paramount. So that your department head and other senior mentors in the department, particularly those that serve on the promotion and tenure committee, will be very helpful in helping you decide and helping you plan what's going to be the right balance for you. There's a question on the floor, but it's not too personal of a question. Great to have an amazing PI and a fruitful relationship, but what if the PI does not really care about the student's future or is just not the perfect match? What do you recommend to a PhD student whom the PI is not willing to invest in their relationship? I'm going to turn this to the students because I already know how they're going to respond. <laughs> you want to go first? I could go. Well, I learned that the hard way, but I think that I think it's important for you to make like your own self-reflections on what you need, what is best for you, for your success, for your professional career. Um, and I would simply request to change my 
mentor. I would change, I would advocate for that change as much as I could. Um, I know students that have changed major professors twice, three times even, and have questioned even changing the third time. And to me, is if you want to be successful, you have to have a team that you have to be surrounded by a team that will basically push you to success or motivate you to, to that success. And if you don't have that in that relationship, then I think it's doing a disservice, disservice to you, to them, and to the time that you're spending together. So I would advocate for change as much as possible. I would agree. Um, I would make do some investigation on who may seem to fit more, maybe do some informational interviews with different people, um, just so when you make that change, you don't have to do it again. And so doing some more background work before actually formally making that decision and moving forward would probably be beneficial. I would add one more thing, which is like, you don't have to have the same research interest with your, with, mm -hmm. with that mentor. Like my my relationship with Dr. Jordan, I don't have the same research, specific research um, that she does. Um, I'm completely different. I'm doing immigration policy, but we still, she still is able to send me information related to immigration uh, um, uh, conferences or uh, journals, uh, etc. So I think that you don't need to have a, a specific match in terms of your research interest. It would be ideal, awesome if you have it, but if that relationship is not working, even with that match, then you need to move on to someone that will be more supportive to you. Ebony, anything to add? No, I don't have anything to add. Okay, but from a faculty perspective, I would also support what the students are saying. At minimum, you need a co-major professor uh, tie. This person is not invested in helping you to meet your goals. I'm sorry, I think, I think that's synonymous with major professor in my opinion. And so if they're not invested in where you need to be in three, five years, certainly beyond the program, um, at minimum, you need a co-advisor. And maybe, um, it sounds like your funding may be tied to the PI. That may help to buffer um, the moving away from them completely so that you don't have a funding issue. But it may come to a point where you've got to make a best decision um, in your own long-term relationship because they're not really holding up their end of the bargain. When you sign up for this responsibility, it's very clear what it's about. And those national resources on graduate mentoring will help you clarify what you're looking for, what's not being, what's not happening in your current relationship. So to Leslie's point, um, help make a better choice this next time around. Um, you can also speak to your director of graduate education, an ombudsman on your campus to help navigate that or other folks within the graduate college. Um, in terms of the cups, there's a question on the floor about that. The cups are just a holiday gift, uh, but it's difficult to buy for six different people um, sizes, all those types of things. So I just do one standardized gift. And so the cups are just an easy thing that I can send in the mail. Typically I'm behind. I usually don't start my personal shopping for Christmas until I don't know, the 23rd or 24th of December. So the students are never around for me to give them something that would be breakable. And then like half the students are not in residence anymore. But the cups are a way in which I can give them something that's functional. Um, and a way in which I can personalize our respective relationship and where they are going um, in the short term and more importantly in the long term. And the last question we may have time for, um, someone wanted to ask how much are you involved um, with the students out of the office, organize events out of the office to help the students relax and bond? And what do I think about that? Um, so we have had lunch a couple of years ago outside of the office. I met the students at the university's restaurant, at our hotel restaurant, and we had a nice lunch together. We've also had a retreat at that same restaurant to talk through goals and things of the like. But with half the students now not in residence and the other half the students that are, primarily our bonding is through Zoom video conferencing. And um, I know other major professors have students over their homes, um, have them over for dinner regularly, and that's great for them. But that's 
a boundary that I just do not wish to cross with these women at this time. Um, it engenders a whole lot of things that I'm really just not prepared for as a major professor. So kudos to those faculty members that do that on a regular basis with their team for their own reasons. But that's just not um, what I can uphold on a, on a regular basis. Um, it depends a lot of times the holidays and those types of things are really not a good time for me anyway. Um, and so um, I really just try and meet with them in a more professional arena or we have had more retreat um, type meetings out at the uh, university restaurant uh, here on campus. And that we want to thank you all. We are out of time today, but thanks for the great conversation and all the very best to you in your respective endeavors. And before folks head out of the room, I just want to say a huge, huge, huge thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, excuse me. Um, you shared such open and honest reflections with us, and that is not easy to do in person or online, but I would imagine all the more so online. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, thank you. Thank you for that honesty and discussing today. I think our attendees really appreciated it. And with that, uh, thanks everyone for attending. I'm gonna go lose my voice apparently, and we hope everyone has a wonderful spring.